Hello and welcome to this week's, or probably more accurately, this fortnight's MadAxman.com podcast after our bank holiday break a couple of weeks ago. Um, in this week's episode, there's all sorts of things. The full team of seven are back. We've got all sorts of painting in 28 mil scale down to teeny tiny ships. We have also have a look at transfers and the cost of those and all sorts of other usual nonsense. I'm sorry I think you're an ass. Debates the vexed subject of the American Civil War. Why bother? And also Andy's quiz returns, of course, in its decreasingly onanistically themed new format. So sit back, enjoy the podcast, and we'll see you again in a couple of weeks' time after this one wraps up. This means war. Well, welcome everybody. After a two-week hiatus, in fact, possibly even a standard two-week hiatus, as um, as we lurch into the times when it's actually light in the evenings and things are open, we're we're recording this on Monday, the glorious twelfth, when um, when it is actually possible to leave the house, and we all think it's a huge, huge step forwards towards that glorious time when Peter can properly get his hair cut. Um, although I don't, I understand. Well, not I understand. I can see you've not managed to fit that in today, um, but maybe in a fortnight we'll be um, we'll be seeing a, a slightly less American Civil War generalist version of, of Peter, which which is a link to something in the future as well. Um, we don't just throw this crap together. But I am, of course, joined by the full set of seven, as and we've now got after missing the bank holiday weekend last um, last weekend last week's episode we've now got a full two weeks of painting excitement to talk about and to to dive straight into and um, I'm sure other gluing excitements and and other different bits and pieces as well so if I start um, on the south coast with with Mr Adam um, this week let's have a look or let's have a a discuss oh is is, is that the sound of, of a brush being rattled in a tin in a glass pot full of water or something and you you're literally di- painting at the moment but two weeks what's gone on how much has been um been done and finished and cleared the decks well excitingly enough i've done quite a lot i finished painting and rigging those couple of ironclad ships i was doing mm-hmm. and again they're sort of like war game standard but they're now ready to go and they're um in in the box and um, so that was good i then um prepped up the next um thing before I started the painting the nights, thing. Does that need which was the, the Vixtrix 12 millimeter Germans. So I've uh-huh. prepped up a load of them um, and they're all sort of like prepped on bases and all nice undercoated black now ready to paint. Oh, this is the infantry, um, you mean? Yeah. You actually, you actually got the little soldiery people. Oh, yeah, I got them out. And uh-huh. um, it's interesting because I forgot how many there are in a pack. I think it was 184 in a uh-huh. pack. I think it's they're sort an of like enormous go, amount, isn't it? Yeah, it's a full come, which, which is kind of okay. The thing, but opening the pack and looking at it, they've kind of done a company. So okay. if you were doing company one to one, I think it's quite possible you've got everything you need to do one to one company. But for that amount of infantry, I would have preferred to have some engineers, someone with a flame flower, and some sort of yeah. like mines lobbing, okay. and maybe a, right. maybe a few more artillery spotters, and like because all it is is sort of like machine guns. Um, Rifleman, etc. Et okay. They've given um, they've given eighty mil and fifty mil mortars, but even then, it's late war German, so I'm surprised that they've got fifty mils. But it's um, we'll see how it goes. I've got um, I'm. Can, can you tell the difference in twelve mil? Really? Um, one is the fifty mil mortar is quite small, and it's just like one bloke lying down holding it, kind of oh, like right. that. Okay. Yeah. Whereas the eighty mil is a proper sort of like proper like, standing there like that, another one. Um, passing a shell so um, okay. that's different but um, so they're undercoated black um, and I'm going to be painting them in the same style that did me Russians and we did those American Civil War yeah. um, troops because that works quite well for a quick thing sort of like the black so surf dry brush, in the it? shade um, and put things on and because they're quite dark colours I think that it, it's not too hard to do that over black so um, they're ready to go um, and I've also um, after that I started painting my uh, Perry uh late medieval knights and i've got um the all the riders done and i'm just starting on horses now which is what you saw me merrily uh washing my brush for mm-hmm. and that's um in check. firstly um 
Do you know, last time I asked, can anyone recommend where I could get some transfers for medieval transfers type stuff? Yeah, that was that was a couple of weeks ago, definitely. Yeah, yeah. Now, I, I think when, well, I, I looked at Battle Flag. I actually got, I just got a sheet of um, Fleur de Lis, 15 mil Fleur de Lis from uh, Veni Vidi Vici, hmm. because uh, the 15 mil ones, I thought that would look quite good if I actually put them onto the blokes and that's work. They, if anything, it's slightly too large. So it would be perfect for 15 mil ones would be perfect for heraldry on Caprisons. Mm. Um, but I've got a couple. I don't hang on. Look. I'm not sure if you can see this, but um, this is chap, a bit glossy because I haven't done the varnish yet. But can you see that? Yes, that's, that's not a bad size, one. actually. A 15 mil fleur de lis, a white one going on. It's to... yellow, but yeah. Yeah. Okay. No, that works kind of cutely, definitely. Uh, so that kind of worked. But I did look at Battle Flag, and that was a bit disappointing because they didn't really do that many. But um, one thing that they did do um, is um, transfers for the Fireforge... Yes, the Fireforge Knights. Teutonic. Flowy, yeah. Yeah, Teutonic Knights, which is good because um, in my sort of like strategy of what 25 mil armies I'm going to do, I want the medium knights army and I was going to do the Teutonics hmm. because I think you can get away with having absolutely no fur um, and the Teutonic knights, they've got that whole snow Nazi sort yeah, of like big, big storm with, you know, wings and stuff on it, all sorts of things going on, which looks quite good and you can also have some guest knights add the colour as well so hmm. I, I was going to do them so I, I, I was interested in looking at the Fireforge um, transfers but that was and they gave it really good write up, you get enough transfers to do the whole box um, and I think they even said it was the official transfers of the Fire Forge. Yeah. But for one sheet of transfers to do 12 figures, hmm. £10. That's half which, as much as the figures, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, well, that's 50%. That's adding almost a pound onto the price of each figure, which is like... Yeah. And I've argued before now when we talked about the cost of figures, especially 15 mil figures, I, I said I think a fair price is higher rather than the lower end of what's sold for. But £10 for transfers for 12 figures i'm thinking that starts yeah, to feel like i'm being ripped off i mean that's yeah. more expensive than little big man and yeah, even yeah, little yeah. even little big man i'm like oh right oh. then because it's romans and they'll make it look fantastic mm. um so i doubt if um i doubt if i'll be buying them but i'll probably I suppose be at the end of the day it is black crosses isn't it really yeah, it's not even particularly thing. So um, I'll probably be sort of like ripping some stuff on the internet, buying some transfer printer paper, and getting you to do it on your flash new printer. To be perfect. Yes. Honest. Yeah, quite possibly. I hope you get some transfers for aeroplanes and use them. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yes. out of my Actually, yeah, there's got to be some Second World War German. You know, yeah, yeah, buy buy yourself a Fokker Wolf or something, <laughs> and um, and use that one. Yeah, but, the Knights yeah. of the Heinkel Order or something. <laughs> Yes. Yeah, you'll have to you'll be able to use the nose art on it and stuff like that. That would be good. <laughs> but, but the um my uh, medieval late medieval knights have painted up quite well because I actually I, I was gonna say go to but, town, but, but it's such... just a cross, isn't it? Can't you just paint that. No, it's it's to make it Is look there an echo good in here? On... sorry. Is there an echo in here? <laughs> but... but to make it look well, good I don't on... know why you're getting transfers. What on the why? Flying, on it's the a cross. Cap again on the flowing caprison it's quite hard to do and it's not just a cross it's quite a sort of like the ends are flared and it's a it's a german it's cross. cross. no it's like the ends are flared if you want to make it look it's, good it's i don't cross. have the, i don't have the skills to do them cross. symmetrically on a regular basis so if you just want to get sort of like a black felt tip and draw a cross onto your figures you're more than welcome but I, I caring about um caring having self respect enough to want to do I'm um, good Across. figures. I thought I would. Um, I'll, I'll get Tim to print them out for me. Um, Peter, are you teeing uh, yourself up to do a rant for future weeks? On um, I'm sorry, I think you're an ass. It's just like it's a, no, 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 need to do a future e. So I'll do it now. It's like just do it why? now. You're just straight into it. You're why? just onto it. No, okay. it's just overkill. Well, it's but here's the question. Here's a, here's a more genuine. Here's a, here's a genuine question. If I mean, I like. I do like the Teutons for the whole snow Nazi thing. Mm. Um, but painting that amount of white, Tamsin, how, how, how would you do that? Painting that amount of white to making it look good? Simon, Ooh, yeah, Simon I a spray can, can is not the answer. Yeah. yeah that's, answer like from Tamsin. that's one. I'll probably start with, uh, like for the comparisons, I'd probably start with, with 
sort of a pale blue gray and okay. slowly, add, slowly add white into into that okay and build so up from there build it up over a lot of layers yeah um which 50. i probably won't be bothered um to yeah. and this uh, this is for the future anyhow um but that's good but i'm pleased yeah, I, with um, I, if you don't want to do do the time consuming way so i paint it white get it i paint it white and then use a gray wash okay a blue gray wash, gray wash. a blue because gray I... wash into into Who makes blue gray wash Create, create your own wash, yeah. yeah. Or just do Knights Hospitaller, and then you just spray them black with some white crosses. Undercoat them grey. Undercoat them Spray them black, black spray, straight cross, white cross, done. Yeah, Peter, again, I think the, um, the answer of how do I paint Teutonic Knights white, the answer of don't paint Teutonic Knights isn't really where <laughs> yes. we're going with this podcast. It's yeah, like... absolutely. Knights Hospitaller, so much yeah. easier. Yeah. <laughs> I to be quite honest, I'm surprised at Peter not suggesting spraying them with gold first. Exactly. Well, yeah. actually, there's certain ones where you can actually use a bit of gold. Uh, some of the Teutonics <laughs> add a bit of bling on them. Yeah, but but they'll just have messy old crosses if you're doing them. So so we're saying there's there's such a thing as a grey blue wash. Yeah. Or do you just I, make it with a bit of paint and water? Make and it. I pale blue grey or mid or sort of mid. Mid blue grey, I thin down, dilute down with water okay. and a bit of flow aid, and yeah. No, I must admit, because I've got some 15 mil Merliton Teutons, which I kind of painted white and then they were too white. And then I tried to do a, a kind of a, you know, army painter style wash on them and they look pretty yeah, grim. Army painters, it just doesn't army work. Paint's kind of going to make it sort of very black in the recesses. Well, this makes them very brown. They just look yeah. like they've been rolling around in the mud too much. And then, um, and then I don't know, Adam, are you thinking about if you do are thinking about Teutonics, are you thinking gamble with the snow effect as well and just go full Teutonic, or is that just no nah, bollocks to that? Um, I think is the um honest I, I think they'll be sort of like fighting in a bit where the snow's melted. Yeah. Um, it's still probably quite cold, but um because I think I could do quite a good snow effect because you can buy quite good snow effect stuff I've, I've you could do it by stuff. buying it yeah I could, I could i could stick stick it onto you the are good suit. at shopping yes okay but again it's like if there's ever going to be a morphage in the future mm. then it would be a case of sort of like six bases of your army um um because they're sort snow. of like allied with the poles or something have got snow um yeah. and the, the army yeah, hasn't snowed on well, Jeff, so, I, sort of what you could do just give a frosty effect on on the grass Dry brush. I do do basing as normal. Add static grass, whatever. And then go over. Then dry brush the grass with with white or off off white. Okay. I'm sorry. You you're saying there's a specific. You go off white for the snow. Is that is that kind of somebody's been pissing What's in it or something? Is that a different thing or? <laughs> no. No, no, not talking no. Sort of a yellow off white. Not going for the yellow off white. Just slightly <laughs> off white. Slightly. If the horses have passed scrubbing. by, yes. Yeah, Thanks just the horses have changed it up. Yellow snow. No. So Dave, um, if you're talking about yellow snow and it looks like you're you're pouring some onto is that is that ketchup or are you doing something with static grass? That's no, it may be a static grass applicator, your knock knock applicator. So if you what have you managed to fit in and, and finish over the last couple of weeks in between, you know, your lurching lurching around and, and scaring small animals and, and old ladies around various North London suburbs. Um, it looks like I'm guessing the Battle of the Boing is ready to go and ready to be fought. They look like Mexican they bandits. They are literally finished. Literally they really finished. Are finished. Wow. I'm lying. There's two two more bases of cavalry which need flocking, which I'm doing as we sit here. And okay. The entire Fogar army done. Fantastic. Twelve six packs. 12 that's astounding that's a lot yeah and uh all with wire spears drilled into the bases given wow. permanency um then two fogar units of cavalry so that's eight bases mm -hmm. little battalion guns teensy witsy little battalion guns oh super cute yeah on little round bases uh, as well they're really tiny there's markers yep and uh, oh, and the Scotsman, I've got two tw two twelve packs of Scotsmen. I'm really pleased with Scotsmen. 
Mm. They look really good. So, oh, I'm, I'm, I think they look great. So you, you mastered the art of tartan over the last couple of weeks then? I wouldn't go that far. I would not go that far, but I can make a passable representation of tartan. Sort of squinty tartan then. So have you um have you had any time to, you know, now this has been looming over you for so long, have you had time to think about what might be next? No. Um, <laughs> no. It's um, just I, blocked I, it out. I mean, as we were saying a couple of, well, a little while ago, we were both, Peter and I were talking about the uh, Syrians from Kurasan, but I'm starting to think, hopefully Mr. Kurasan is listening, which is very unlikely. But he, he can, he's a bit slow at putting his stuff on his website. It can take a while, so I'm not sure. But then I anticipate in the next few weeks we're going to be sitting there going, oh, bloody hell, I haven't got enough of those or I haven't got enough of this. So um, Yeah, I suppose with version four, there's always the possibility of needing an extra one or two or, or repurposing yeah. a couple of things or you know doing up the livery to make them slightly different um or, or appear as different sort of troop types really to to fit together some other extra armies so there might be a kind of flurry of infill work which could be interesting well i, th I think there, there's i mean i think we, we're probably likely to have a few things the romans are going to change aren't they a little bit and uh yeah, from some of the some of the hints that have come out, there's yeah. there's a few little bits. I think you know, I, hopefully, it won't be too much in terms of of mass rebasing or anything like that. But but a little bit is just good, isn't it? It gives you a chance to update some older troops. The Ro late Roman ballista guys on the table. Yeah, getting ready with your your bolt shooters and your medium machine guns. Yeah, and stuff like that. This means war. Well, look, let's let's move in round. Um, Peter, other than not having your hair cut, um, I guess, you know, if, if it falls forward over your eyes, that may obscure whatever you, you were supposed to be painting. But a couple of weeks ago, you were you were sort of almost on a painting hiatus, weren't you, I think? Yeah, I've just been really busy with work, so um, mm. I didn't manage to do much. Uh, did a bit of um, uh, basing, finishing off a few bits. Um, I didn't want to pick up anything to um delicate because um you Should know when you have one of those faces? fingers no yeah yeah, yeah. felt like okay. I, I felt like sort of you know a hulk moment if i tried yes. to do those prussians me crash yeah. me kill <sighs> polish lads is now squashed uh no i was feeling a bit like that with the uh, fun stuff at work so uh just hmm. did some basing which you know uh throwing a few rocks around even though they're little, tiny rocks but it makes you feel a little bit better about life yeah um yeah. that that and sort of plotting various things as uh, Dave was saying about uh, looking at some of the uh, uh, new ADLG version ideas and thinking about what I'd add and what I'd add to the shopping list so doing a basic inventory of a whole bunch of stuff and finding out that oh I've got this I've got that all ready to do some tweaks and uh, supplement different armies if I chose or otherwise researching a couple of things to find some snazzy models for ballistas and such like for uh, maybe some Romans and a couple other things. Were you were you a kind of a ballista, cart mounted ballista free zone then before now? Well, they... I was actually going to ask uh, your uh, opinion on that. Um, yeah. The the group here should it be cart mounted or shouldn't it be? Um, I've seen some with the cart and some without, and I'm not sure about it. I mean, they, they used it in England actually, and they had a whole range of them to shoot at um, one of the. Uh, Walled forts, villages, didn't yeah. they? Hmm. Forts, um, and they collected a whole host of ones. But should they be on the carts or not? So, as a war gamer and a miniature painter, I would say yes to both of them because you need yeah. all the options. Yeah, <laughs> that's a good spot, actually. Yes yeah. to both. Yeah. yeah, yeah, carts and no carts. You get both of them, really. But and trebuchets and ballistas. <laughs> so and I, I've got, I've got trebuchet. Yeah. I've got, um, I've got catapults. Um, it's just getting the um, the, the bolt throwers. Because you, well, need I, one, I guess... you need one cart with a legionnaire at the back of it, sort of 50 cal point. Uh, yeah, it's like the 50, 50 cal, cal get some yeah. style. Yeah. Yeah, out the top of a half track or something. I don't know. I must admit, if, if the rules are introducing a new concept of artillery, what can fire over Romans, to me, that says stick the damn thing on a cart so it can actually fire over Romans. 
um, as opposed to being an artillery piece behind that you're kind of going, um, do they all kind of lean, you know, somebody blows a whistle and half of them lean to the left and half lean to the right and then psh, straight through kind of like a, a free kick through a wall. But um, so I'd, I'd go with cart, but um, and also I guess you're still, no, light artillery can now move and fire, can't it? So yeah, you might exactly. drag it up, but, but adding it on a cart, it's just going to be able to see over other stuff, which will just look a bit more, and More it realistic. just gives it that extra. I, I do like the uh, fifty cal bit. I've you yeah. know fired that before, and it's a lot of fun. So mm. they're kind of like technical Romans. <laughs> yeah, Roman technical Romans. Yeah, yeah, it can be a jumpy mounted Romans. A, yeah, that'd be good. Or a so Toyota yeah, cart. okay. Romans on car, carted Romans. Uh, yeah. What other Romans would I need? Um, there was looking at some of them where they have the two-handed choppers. I know you were saying about those, Tim. Yeah, there's going to be some of those in the rules, isn't there? I think going back to the other ones, I think um, I'm a big fan of Donington's artillery because artillery crew, because yeah. they come as singles and they're really nice figures. I think yeah. Tamsin, yeah. you started that a few months ago, didn't you, with the um, yeah. with the gay dancing, um, the gay Gordons or whatever they were, with yeah. the two hands up and down. Um, I think the video is still somewhere on the, yeah. on the podcast website, I believe. But um, but yeah, that's a really good way to get the crew for those those artillery and, and bolt shooters. Um, and then yeah, there's going to be some. We don't quite know how many or how, but I guess they're Aurelian's Palestinian clubmen, which I suspect are are in an army's and enemies book somewhere. But um, and God knows what they're going to look like. Yeah, my my uh, uh, early Roman. Uh, Empire Army is uh, Imperial Roman, sorry, uh, Corvus Bell, one of the first yep. armies I did when I was getting back into mm. uh, miniatures, so hopefully the Donington ones go okay with that, you know, going back to the scale creep as uh, Adam yeah, likes I think, to call I think it. you can get the Corvus Bell ones again now, can't you, from in plastic, from PSC? Yeah, I'm not no. sure. <laughs> Let's not go there, but they okay. don't do a um, artillery pieces. No, um, no. I've, I've got a couple Absolutely. of Corvus belly um, artillery pieces, which I've never used. What are they? Um, yeah. them. Uh, they, don't, they don't have the little bolt shooters, though, do they? They ha uh, only yeah, have the I've larger the, stuff. I've got the bolt shooters. Mm. Actually, I think they, the, the plastic ones do the bolt shooters, but it's one of those weird ones where I think that's one of the um, figure packs that's more expensive than buying in metal. Um, from someone else so i think they've got the pricing a bit weird on that one but um, that's a little bit odd but yeah look at look at the range of donnington crew there's all sorts and you buy them in singles so you can cram as many onto the base as you want really with that one so yeah so really it's been mule, a, mule mounted mule carts uh bolt shooters that sounds fun okay so it's been a it's been a um a fortnight of prep then really but you're planning for something you don't know quite what it is yet yeah planning for something not quite sure what but i'm definitely gonna have a bit of a laugh with it um, okay. I'm due to a few days off, so um, I'm booking a couple of days towards the end of the month where I'm just going to take a break and uh, mull over the new book as it lands on the table and uh, planning uh, different armies because um, I entered a few competitions for the summer, uh, doing London GT and maybe a couple of others, so I'm uh, quite looking forward to it. Uh, right, as okay. Dave was saying, though, that still waiting for the Curacao to post the Assyrians or, up. Yeah, and then maybe that will come in in time with um, with when the new lists come out because there there might be some changes to those biblical armies. I think from yeah. from some of the snippets that come out. Um, okay, then. Tamsin, what what about you? You've um you've had a little dibble into the conversation and talking about painting up white. And yeah. last time you, I think last time you just finished the teeny tiny American Civil War and you yes, were starting what we now see before us on a screen share. Um, yeah, some bloody amazing looking um, U.S. paratroops in the jungle. Yeah, I started off, yeah, so I've actually done a fair bit of painting over the last 13 days. And I had these, they were based and I'd added for base texture. But I had, yeah. and I was going to prime them the day, I, the day after we recorded the last one. So I got that done, I've painted up some of the test figures, checked the paint scheme and realised... They came out a bit too. I the green uniform green was a bit little bit too dark as the as the BAR as it was the BARs and bazooka teams. They'd be later war, so yeah, that was fair enough. That's interesting. So you've and got um, oh. it was one of those bits when I was going through the photos, I realised 
oh, I didn't take any of the photos of these after I'd varnished them. So, <laughs> and taken them off, off the painting stand, so. Okay. So, uh, then got through this photo, got fir my first, first batch of 12 with readjusted paint scheme. Those have got astonishing uh, faces. Are these, um, which, which manufacturer are these? I, these, I think mostly are in this photo, it's mostly artisan uh, and I think there might be a couple of Crusader in there. Okay. And did you right, deliberately so think, lighten the uniforms because they're, they're sort of tropical climate and, you know, you, you. Not because it's tropical climate, but because it, for 1943, they, I, they would have been in the M1942 uniform, which was issued in olive drab number three, which is quite a yellowish green. Okay. No, they do look quite yellowish. Um, is there a chap there with a Japanese hat in the back corner? Um, no, no. Uh, no. That's, okay. that's Just a bandage. Okay. Is, no, 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 I'm looking at the one next to it. He looks a little bit like he's stolen the Japanese hat. Oh, that one. Yeah. Yeah. That one. No, it's a I have a woolen beanie cap. Okay. God, those are amazing little figures. They're, you must be really pleased with those. Yeah, so the first batch I painted was... I yeah, it looks like the, radar from Mash, the, doesn't it? HQ squad and 60 millimeter mortar squad. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. And oh, then yeah. I painted up first rifle squad. Yeah, okay. Oh, and super little faces, yeah. Squad sergeant, the LMG team, rifle team, and second right, second rifle squad. Yeah, this was the bonus one, wasn't it? Yeah, this one happened by accident. I don't seem to remember. No, this was like so. I had for two right, two rifle squads. So I've actually got my full full platoon. Wonderful. Wonderful. Plus Thirteen days plus the eight test figures yeah so you're just now itching for the um the pub to be open again so that these can take the field in um, i'm trying to remember, was this for um chain of command particularly or? yeah it's the chain of command and yeah. so i've got stuff i uh, working on uh, got most of the way through a uh, the next batch of 12 figures which is yeah i so i support it i support elements so okay. medic, sniper, engineer, uh, forward observer, uh, tripod MG team. So that's kind of um, over the last two weeks. Then that works out probably about two figures a day, on on average, roughly. You know, there's there's probably about thirty of them there, isn't there? Um, it's just done. Thirty-six plus the eight test figures. All oh, right, okay. So three a day. Then you've been absolutely yeah. motoring. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So how much? Um, you know, I guess you go in in fits and spurts, but is there dare you even think on um, you know what the average time per day is? How much time has gone into those thirty six? Um, trying to work out how many. Uh, can well, feed the fifth. Probably, about, you, probably, about, can four, probably about four hours a day, actually. Okay, all right. So, so only then a week's solid nine to five work equivalent. Yeah. That's. That's good. And that's fantastic. They look absolutely awesome. They're, they're lovely figures as well. You must be. Is that oh, a yeah. company that the you've got? The Arsen figures are, are great. I've Crusader. Yeah. Mm, they're okay. They don't, they don't have quite quite as much character. Yeah. No, do you, is there a, someone who sculpts all that range? Or um, I'm trying to think who it is. Oh, um, I'm, not, I'm not sure who. I, no. I should know who the sculptor is. Yeah. Well, I can't quite remember. Okay. Intriguing. Um, all right then, and then um, so is that? No, oh, you now actually you're about you're now about two thirds of the way through this project, so there'll be more of these people, yeah. but more specialists. Um, one question actually with the bazookas, because I've I'm denied about this in in smaller scales, not twenty eights, but smaller yeah. scales. Is your I saw your bazookas were just kind of all green. Um, is there a, you know a rationale for having little spots of colour on bazookas, or were they just all green? But I were all green. I the parts which would which would be sort of wood, wooden, wooden, plain metal. But on those figures, you don't actually get to see those. Fine. The the, sh the, the shoulders stop. Shoulders yeah, stop. it's actually okay. hidden on the, on the right. On the 
Is, Maybe um, I'm thinking about um, more modern, you know, ATGW teams and things like yeah. that, where there's sometimes little spots of yellow and red or whatever, but not on a second world war bazooka. Yeah, I haven't seen any 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 markings on, on any markings at all. It's just a big tube and a lump of um, yeah. lump of metal that fires things at people. Okay, yeah. all right. Um, well, just whizzing around the um, the circuit then, Simon. What about you over the last? couple of weeks have you been back on the painting mojo has, it, has something else started or still chewing through the uh, macedonians i uh, have been doing some painting um i have painted something in the in honor of peter we have uh, team badger here so, okay uh, there's something badger related really that's well cool. that's a... it's four mm. cataphracts all painted in gold uh -huh. hey. Golden nice cataphracts. i like it so these are some cataphracts who um, these guys here, um, I think they're museum ones. These yeah, are, they look museum, don't they? Yeah. These are ones that I painted pretty spectacularly um, badly um, a few years ago. So using that bias strip, stripped them right back down and repainted them all up and using the um, bright gold and a little bit of a wash, get quite a nice effect on the, the armour. So when I put them down the table, you can go, yep. They're cataphracts because they're so different to all the other cavalry. So um, they came out quite nice. So this will be um, Team Badger, all four yeah. cataphracts. No, is that, meant to be a cat is that meant to be a Seleucid army? It's the it's the a combination of Seleucid, uh, Alexander the Greek, um, random other bits. So it's just been dribs and drabs as I get motivated to try something different. So did a couple of hoplites, then the cataphracts, then did a, um, a pikeman, the companions, and came back and did more um, hoplites. Oh, I, I see that you've um, you put those hoplites on forty by forties to give them a bit more, more yeah. space to kind of be a bit more. But they still look really densely clustered, don't they? Yeah. So what I managed to do here, let me uh, stop that one. Share. Yeah. So I've gone for a bit more of a um, densely packed on on the the base. So still, I've gone for the one U D or forty mil square for fifteen mil. Hmm. Um, so you get a little bit of um, space at the front to grab hold of it, especially because yeah. I've gone for a few of the hoplites where they're pointing their spears at the enemy. Some are standing up, some are kneeling down, so you get that more vibrant effect rather than um, Essex miniatures all standing in one formation. Yeah. And um, when you're on, um, on this close-up, you can really, really see the detail on um, those museum casts, aren't they? Mm. On those on those helmets, that's astounding. At, at this kind of close-up. Yeah, really so um, yeah, they're one of those models where when you first start painting it, you think you've lost all the detail, but then when you yeah. do the the, um, the washes, and that's my level of painting, all of a sudden things pop out again. So um, um yeah, quite happy. I think they'll look they'll look they'll look quite spectacular on the table as someone yeah. drives over them, but at least they look pretty. Yeah, no, that's very impressive. Good. So so you've kind of put together the you know the meat and veg for a um. A, a sort of proper or a number of successor armies then um, over mm. the last couple of weeks. Yeah, so I've got one, uh, one pikeman. I've got a bunch more ready to paint. I mean, uh, haven't been able to do any spray painting because it's been snowing in Go Figure. In <laughs> it's April. been all over the shop, hasn't it, weather wise? Definitely. Yeah, yeah. I've got them and then the gentlemen. So then, then, I'll, then I'll have uh, enough to do, I think, most of the Greek armies because I may have a few elephants and a few Indians to do the allied options. So I think I'm okay with those. Yeah, I think we're probably confident that you've got enough elephants there for sure. This means war. Well, you know, if we're if we're stomping around, let's carry on stomping around um, the the screen. And Mr. Finkel, um, you were uh, you were still ankle deep in um, successes and things as well last time we were talking. Where, where's your last couple of weeks painting got you to? Um, I painted the 24 Saracen bowmen for the uh, Normans in Italy. Uh, Normans, so I've got them as a collection of medium foot. And I've now been painting a whole load of 10 mil Pendragon World War II British guys uh, for O Group. O -group. Okay. So what? how have you, you know, because Adam was saying he's gone black undercoat and then... Um, you know, sort of semi dry brush on top. What's your what's your Pendragon approach to those Brits? How you have you laid them up? Um, grey undercoat and then basically British khaki on top, 
and then dabs for um, a lighter colour for the rucksack and the gaiters, a darker brown for the gun, unless it's a Sten gun, in which case it's black, little dab of um, flesh, and then you paint back over the yeah. bits you've overpainted. And then that that's essentially it. Um, yeah. Some of them are paratroopers, so those I've done in more slightly different coloured smocks with brown and then a bit of green and then a sort of slight... Yeah, but what, what about the hats, though? What about the hats? That's the only thing I care about, obviously. Well, most of them have got helmets, but some of them do have... Um, do have berets, and those will be painted in a proper beret colour. Yeah, uh, well, as many of them as you can, definitely, as many of them as you can. Yeah, yeah. Dave's, Dave's wearing, waving some Scottish berets at us as well then. Yeah, anyway, I mean, yeah. I wouldn't be painted in the colour of Dave's bobble hat, but it's a, just, yeah. I just want to reassure you on that. No, uh, but the, the risk is, though, Andy, the discussion about Dave's bobble hat came before we started recording, so anybody listening to this is wondering what on earth that means and hoping it doesn't mean what they think. So um, <laughs> hopefully... <laughs> You know, we were talking about an actual genuine bobble hat. Um, not, we weren't going anywhere else with that no one. Bubble. There was well, no a bit, bobble. A, a bit of mystery, you know, could see if, see if anyone's actually listening. Yeah, that's the kind of mystery that people want to remain mysterious, I suspect. Um, and, and less Spe especially if they haven't seen anything, yeah. Exactly. Sure, is bobble hat a euphemism for something? <laughs> is there an echo in here? I've never heard that before. No. Is a bobble What's the euphemism <laughs> for? It's a euphemism for a bobble hat. Yeah, just for a bobble hat. Yeah, sit down, be quiet. You should be on mute again, I think is the answer. Is it euphemism for, euphemism for someone's cock? <laughs> it, it could well be. Yes, Only among well Arsenal be. fans, I believe. Yes, indeed. Yeah, don't go all Tottenham Hotspur on us with that one. Um, so so it's been mostly um, you know, finishing off something and then diving into Second World War then. Yeah, that's right. And, and I'm, to, I'm wrestling with these bloody big tricks tanks trying to stick the things together and... Um, it's a bit frustrating that some of the uh, instructions are a bit basic and you get little bits to stick on. You're not quite sure what they are or where they're meant to go, mm. which is a bit annoying. That's all over. And you've got, have you got half a dozen of the, is it the Cromwells? Yeah, a pack of the six Cromwells and I've got a pack of six Hannah Mags. And they've got oh. some weird, I haven't tried sticking them together yet, but they've got some weird and wacky bits, which you're not quite sure where they go. They look a bit like blankets folded over with their German helmet stuck in the middle and things. Right. Submarine okay. periscopes. Oh, uh, that would be for backpacks. For a Hannah Mag, the backpacks. Yeah, they used to sling them over. They used to sling them over over the, the side. Over the side. Well, these look like well, when you look at the photos, they look like they're stuck on the side. And you you read the painting guide. It's about ten pages of why you need about fifty different colours of oil to to make it look like mud. And you know, a bit more explanation as to these are the little bits. This is where they are. This is where they go. Would have been helpful. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, I think um, we, there's probably, that's now at least three of us could probably do a team rant on the painting instructions on tiny little Victrix tanks. And I think we'd all probably um, still be here next week if we were doing about that one. Um, okay. Well, I think from, from my point of view over the last couple of weeks, it's been a couple of different things. I did actually have a tidy up of the, I'd ended up with too many projects on the go. Um, so I just actually had to tidy up and I put some stuff in boxes <laughs> to stop myself getting distracted and thinking I've got, you know, blue paint on the brush. I'll do a bit of those as well because they probably need some blue. So, so I really zeroed in and, and first of all, I finished off, I don't know, you, you might have seen it on, on Facebook or Twitter, the, um, the Museum Miniatures New Persian Sparabara and um, Immortals, which I, I kind of had hanging around since their sale at right at the beginning of January. In fact, it might have been in December. I think I ordered them and they arrived within about three days, which like, boom. Um, so it might even have been very, very late December that that got done. And um, <coughs> they'd all been undercoated white. And then I'd done a wash on some of them. And I did a real mix of um, normal paints and contrast paints and, and washes on white undercoat to, to really mix up all the different figures because I wanted to achieve this really random, mad, eclectic Persian host look with all the different um, the different Sparabara as well. Um, it was all kind of a bit a bit nutty. Some of them had helmets on. Some of them had, um, you know, the funny little Phrygian caps and stuff. Some had cuirasses. And like um, I think you were saying, Simon, and like that photo showed, I went through this thing and thinking. I've completely lost the detail here. There's just not enough to paint. And 
it is there's not enough to paint but there is enough to pick out with a wash i think is um is the secret it would be nice if they were a little bit more because you've got to be very very careful i think yeah. there were a couple of figures that that had probably lost it but they they kind of got crammed in there but um mm. so but they, they're just about being done on washes and and they were a project that lasted for a long time because I was just doing so many different colours and some patterns. And then at one point, I just went, sod it, I'm just going to start finishing them off. And the real um, thing that really moved them on was was copying my own wallpaper idea for the fronts of the um, the Sparas or whatever they are, the, the Pavisi things. So, so I did some Google searching for for Persian patterns and things like that, shrunk them down really tiny and, and stuck them on. So all of the different pavises have all got this different kind of rug type pattern on them. Um, so they're really, really bright and colorful and, and they all look mad and all look a bit different. I've been pinging some of the pictures onto the, the WhatsApp group as well. Um, you're probably all sick of the sight of them, but it was it was quite a lot of work to, to get them all done. Um, and and I threw I got them all done and based them on they're all on forty by forties but like you Simon I set the front rank of Pavis guys back a bit to to give some space and then most of them I managed to fit two ranks of archers in as well so there's between twelve and fourteen figures on each of the six bases the front four um, Pavis bearers there's normally one guy kind of shooting through there or or you know reaching through with an axe or something as well to give it a bit of animation. And um, and I put them on Facebook and up on Twitter. And, and I think it was my most, um, you know, reacted post, Mad Axeman post on, on Facebook ever. I think I shared it to, to about three groups and it got nearly 100, well, over 150 likes and, you know, ticks or smiles or whatever. So um, it, it really made an impact, but... Um, you know, and I think I'm, I'm going to, so many people are going, how did you do it? And I think it's, it's a new technique. And I'm going to call it 2D printing and, um, and see if it takes off. Really, it could be the future for, for the future of wargaming. But so they've, they've been done. And, and in this random weather, I did manage to get them varnished as well. And then um, oh. just before we go on question, yeah, yeah. On now, yeah. um, one thing that I think is the greatest about washes, it always impresses me mm. when I manage to do it. because I just go, wow, that's brilliant. Because I love doing washes on faces because a good yeah. figure, if you put a wash on, it goes from my, I'll put flesh colour on it to there's a facial expression and there's yeah. a face. I, think it, I love that effect on faces. Those figures, even though you can see detail elsewhere and done washes elsewhere, the, the faces do seem quite... Um, I didn't no, wash the faces. Back. I actually didn't wash the faces. or um, And I'm not sure if that's because I didn't wash the faces or because I haven't washed the faces yet. Um, I've still got to, to work that out. Um, so I may go back and put put washes on them. And there, there was an element of these have taken so bloody long. Um, I'm running out of patience to, to carry on doing it because I knew that I was going to pack so bloody many of them um onto a base that it was just going to be a complete mass effect and i think it's a it is that classic thing of if you take a photo and blow it up really big they never look other than if they're tamsins in which case they look fucking better the closer you get you bastard um but if they're um if they're normal mere mortals the bigger you get it you can see where they're just badly painted but on mass they look um just really much more impressive and the and i knew the visual was going to go to the pavises and the shields so i kind of wanted the visual to be a line of pavises and then a mess behind it that was almost part of it so i may go back and add a wash to those as well but as they've been undercoated and then the the flesh paint i've got is a bit gloopy and and I, you know it's pretty rough and ready with the the hats and the rest of it around there um I don't know how much extra I will get with a wash on these faces with this thickness of paint on them mm -hmm. for something this small that you won't see anyway versus the the two foot, three foot test of going a wash might darken the flesh and and make them not as, you know, they're almost like, um, I guess, whether you would, would you do a wash on 10 mil figures 
because you actually want the face to pop a bit more or on six mil, you know, so they're almost a little bit like that. I kind of, so that's, that's sort of my excuse for being a bit lazy um, and partly for forgetting it as well, but it is a good point and I may well go back and, and add it at some other point, but they really are all about drawing the eye to those, um, those mad colored pavises and hoping that, um, you know, people don't notice too much that the rest of it is a bit of a dog's breakfast. Well, and, those, uh, th th that, those wallpaper things that you've got are really good. And I'll tell you why, because somebody I saw on Facebook did a Persian army of Darius the Great recently. And the figures are quite nicely painted, but he did one of those war towers. I'm mm. not sure it was exactly the same make as yours, but he didn't have wallpaper on it. And it looked really dull by comparison. Yeah, well, I think, you know, for, um, for, re for cheating, for drawing the eye away from um, painting and just doing stuff, it does actually work. Um, and I think the Persians have to be quite colourful. And so after I kind those of those rugs are definitely colourful. They're oh. definitely colourful. Definitely colourful. Let's hope they're um they're decent. Persian um, carpet bearers. Persian carpet bearers. Yeah. Persian Why not? Carpet bearers. Yeah, they carpet should bearers. be bearers. Bearers because they had big <laughs> spears, but they're actual. Instead yeah. of being happy, if I'd done the little apple symbol all along, you know, it would have been yeah, wonderful exactly. for Steve Jobs, but a bit anachronistic. But um, and then I've I been thought the raiding... apple bearers were the elite guys in the later Persian army, exactly. Oh, it's all the same, they're just Persians. And um, and then I've been kind of wading into the much differently cast iced in Thracians, which I started putting on bases this afternoon. So I've got another, where's it gone? Um, let's reach this from over here. Another eight bases of um, of well, whatever they are, Thracian peltas and and swordsmen and javelinmen and stuff like that and spearmen, and a few bases of, of Thracian light infantry, which will take my Thracians up to sixteen or seventeen bases of Thracian troops um, that will kind of be a kind of Thracian host along with the ones that I've already got painted already, and those are all. Um, Let's drop them back. They're all the Zeiston figures, so they're really consistent and really good, and they do take a, a wash and they take a dry brush really, really well. And the belts on those are about, you know, in real scale, about four inches thick. So it's very easy to to pick them out and paint them. And then I did have a a day yesterday of um, of covering the floor around my desk with small little bits of transparent plastic with um, an LBMS kind of carefully cut them out and ping them on and glue them on and and then a second day of the um the other part of lbms world which is try to match the paint to paint around the edge of the transfer on on the shields which is just a world of painful but um but i think i've just about done it and and they're getting close to being based up and ready to go so you know that's that'll be two big units and and two big steps towards armies being available to play with once we're actually able to start getting back on table and playing what are you going to try next for the transfers then any particular army in mind well i think um i've got a load of medieval 15 mil stuff to redo because i i bio stripped a whole um not legio heroic a whole merliton medieval a medieval italian army um that i painted years ago and i wasn't particularly happy with so so I'm doing some tests with those and um, and I may well do a load of kind of pavises and shields and things for for a, a medieval army to really get the colours because because this printer that we've got, um, you know, it's not it's not a wildly, you know, super top end printer, but it's it's a decent printer. It's like a you know, it's not a 30 quid printer. It's a 80 quid printer, but but it produces so much better quality than the um the printer that we had we've had for about 10 15 years obviously i guess so you can get great detail on really really tiny little things so so i think i'll try to do more of that and and try on some sort of medieval stuff and, and really get those big pattern all those super detailed patterns out there so that's Good probably thoughts. next up you can really go to town because otherwise um some of the standard ones uh, you end up having the sort of same sort of look as someone else rocks up with Whereas yeah. doing your own, you can really go to town on some of the uh, medieval hel hel heraldry. heraldry. Yeah, uh -huh. unless I guess yeah. you do Teutons and just stick a dirty great black cross on them, don't you, Peter? Yeah, just a quick yeah. cross, just you know? Quick bish bosh. Crayon. Yes, bish bosh. With crayon. Yes, and I think on that note, um, that's time to wrap up this painting session. This means war.
So look, so now it's time after having done the painting to move into, I'm sorry, I think you're an ass. Coming up next on Mad Axman Radio, it's I'm sorry, I think you're an ass, the antidote to informed discussion shows. At the piano this week is Scott Joplin, and your chairman is Sir Humphrey Humphreys. Hello and welcome everybody to this week's edition of I'm Sorry, I Think You're an Arse. You join us this week from the Citadel Paints Opera House in Dean's Bottom in Kent, known as the Garden of England for good reason. Nestled gently in the rolling hills of southern England, visitors to the town can climb to the top of a nearby TV broadcasting mast, where they're greeted with a view covering seven different counties. On a clear day, it is sometimes even possible to catch sight of Portsmouth off in the distance despite the many prominent warning signs advising against this. Well, we're here in this wonderful venue and um, we're giving Adam a break this week, which may disappoint some of you, possibly disappoint you even more when you've, um, when you've heard the alternative, which is yet more of me. And this week, I think it might actually literally be today, is when we're recording this, is the anniversary of the start of the American Civil War. And... I think it's the bombardment of Fort Sumter. And then just a week ago was the anniversary of the end of the American Civil War as well, where, um, when you know the surrender was received by Grant and, and all the rest of it after Gettysburg and, and all that kind of stuff. So it's very, very American Civil War themed at the moment. And, and the world of war gaming has been you know, um, all a quiver over Warlord Games' new... Um, unique scale as well for their new well not new but sort of semi-new american civil war game so there's a lot of kind of american civil war stuff floating in the air at the moment and my thoughts on this is really that it's just a load of nonsense the american civil war is a complete waste of time from a war gaming point of view from a historical point of view and it just really the world would be much better if everything to do with the american civil war was just scrubbed from history and from wargaming and we could just jump straight from what happened before to what happened after and just not bother with it at all just utterly completely forget about it and i think the the great quote that sums it up is um is a quote about the american civil war which i think adam you you came um you, you put up was i have nothing to learn from the american civil war it was just two armed mobs chasing each other around the countryside from a man called von Malte and when a man who's most famous for inventing a brand of filter coffee says it's shit, where else do you have to go with that one, really? But but the American Civil War, the big problem I have with it, it achieved absolutely nothing. It started with a load of states in the United States. The United States existed. There were a load of states. Four years later, slightly less than four years later, just the same set of states all back in the United States. I mean, like four years, still same end point, same start point. Zig and Zag were on the big breakfast on Channel 4 for longer than that. You know, OK, let less people died as a result of Zig and Zag, but you get the picture. It's not really a great deal amount of time to start and, and end in the same thing. So, And they always say with the American Civil War, it's famous for being the conflict that had more ink spilt on it than blood. There are just too bloody many books about the American Civil War. You know, you go onto Amazon, <coughs> there's books about the whole war. There's books about the battles, the campaigns, the personality, the food they ate, the footwear they had, what they dressed like, where this, what happened in the cities, what happened on the you know, naval side of it. There's literally hundreds. There are 75 pages of different types of books about the American Civil War. There's even stuff in travel and tourism. You can go on, on battlefield tours. There's social sciences. There's military history. There's an enormous, enormous volume of written material about this four year start point, end point, exactly the same war. And all of them basically boil down to people trying to answer one question. And that question is, well, was it about slavery then? And the answer is always, apart from kind of like completely bonkers, nutty people, well, it's a bit more complicated than that, but yeah, if you be, yes, yes, it was. And all of the books say that every single thing that's just the way it works and it, uh, so is even the same conclusion about what happened about it and um and i think 
you know, the other bit, if you look at the way the thing is, um, the way the thing was organized, it was a very short period of time, start point and end point exactly the same. It's called the American Civil War, which is another big problem I have with it because it wasn't American. The distance from Richmond, which is the capital of the Confederacy, to Washington, D.C., is 133 miles on the US 301. It's 108 miles if you take the I-95, which, you know, of course, it wasn't built then. But um, even so, you'd still drive it in two hours. Um, Sherman or Grant could have popped over any time they wanted. You know, traffic is is bad. It might take you three hours. But even so, a Sherman fucking tank could do it in four hours. So why did this war take four years to try and two people who were that bloody close? It's like it's like saying we had a four year war between London and Bournemouth. You know, unless one of the army stops off in Bird World off the M3 for a couple of years, it's not, you're going to have sorted it out by then. You can meet each other and fight whenever you want. So, but, but there were nearly all the battles were in this tiny, tiny postage stamp bit of America. Um, there were occasional battles elsewhere. You know, people went on holiday and just kind of met up and sort of pretended they had a battle or something like that somewhere warmer. But everything happened in this tiny zone and yet they still didn't resolve it for four years. So the whole war, the naming of it, the concept, the rationale, the start point, <coughs> all of it, all of it's nonsense, but particularly from a war gaming point of view, because, you know, in the American Civil War, there was no tactics, there were no innovations. There was no, actually not even any real success through clever generalship. There was just two armies using the same tactics, blundering around and bumping into each other at various different scales and various different places. It's like, you know, and you kind of go, no, no, surely there must have been something. It's like these armies just blundered around in this really close, tiny space and occasionally bumped into each other. Have you ever seen another war in this period of kind of line up and shoot world in which so many battles were actually fought in forests? One of them was called the wilderness. These people didn't even know how to set up proper terrain. The terrain rules were nonsense. They should have like cleared the, you know, looked for at least open spaces to kind of tear about it. And you read any of the military books, all the narratives of the battles are the same. The odds are irrelevant. Bottom line is one side, somebody panicked, someone was stupid, someone was brave, the other side won. There's no science to it. There's no tactics, there's nothing at all. And <clears throat> the bottom line is the union had more men and equipment and they won in the end, you know, and that's sorry if that's a spoiler for anyone who's not not read the books yet, but it's just they just had more stuff and just brownie in motion and just knocking heads. It just kind of happened. So they even had the same equipment. It was often made in the same factory or they nicked it from each other. They weren't even smart enough to create different caliber ammunition so that, you know, they couldn't nick each other's, um, you know, shells and stuff like that. And, and then they had two types of gun, two types of artillery. And those two types of artillery, they had rifled guns, rifle guns, and they had parrot guns. Parrot guns, as well as rifled, I get it. Parrot guns doesn't even make any sense at all. Rifled and smoothbore, perhaps, not rifled and parrot. You know, if it had been, we've got parrot guns and great crested greed guns, possibly, I see that. But, and even so, all of these guns were so badly made that they kept blowing up, you know, that when they were taking these guns out from the factories or the whatever the word is that you make guns, forgeries, foundries, <coughs> the way they tested them was when they were shipping them, they put them on a train and fired them out into the countryside because if they blew up the first time they were fired, it would only take out one train carriage. So this is just a war of half-hearted incompetence with near identical weapons, some of which have stupid names. And, and war games rules find this all so boring that they have to invent differences between these guns just to pretend that they've not, you know, whoever wrote these rules hasn't just ripped you off with a 30 quid book that says, look, if numbers are equal, you may as well just toss the fucking coin. You know, even 20% either side, it's just a bloody lottery, but everything's the same. So they invent things in which we focus on the rifle guns and the parrot guns as being different. And, and then the other thing that war games rules do in this period, which is utter nonsense, is that they create this romantic psychological advantage which is always a plus one in combat, of the rebels are better charging in. That's the fundamental principle of all American Civil War rules. But if anybody knows anything about any of the period of warfare around this, <clears throat> this is a period of history where 
standing in a line and shooting at people is the way to do this. So the only rules thing to differentiate the two armies is to create an artificial romantic nonsense thing to encourage you to do the wrong thing. Now, how, how mental is that? And you know, it's an encouragement to be stupid and an encouragement to lose is baked into the rules. Otherwise it'd just be a bloody lottery. And then the uniforms, where do we even go with the uniforms? There are hundreds of factories. They're spread all across the States. They're nicking stuff. They wear it for years. They wear it in the field. It's all, always raining. It's always filthy. They're always, um, <clears throat> and then all these things are going to, of course, make it completely different, which means war gamers, of course, get obsessed about what shade of blue, the union war, and, you know, spend huge pages debating this when it's clearly a nonsense. And don't even get me started on bloody butternut. That's not even a colour. That's utter nonsense. It's like looking for Vallejo instant tartan. You're never going to find it. Everybody knows it. Don't waste my bloody time. You know, the bottom line is one lot, they're grey and beige. The other lot, they're blue. That's that's all there is. That's how dull can you get? And like, even if you look at the Sabutio starter set, there's red jerseys and blue jerseys and white shorts and white shorts. There's more colours and variety in the Sabutio starter set than there was in the whole of the American Civil War. And you know, I can see some of you are about to put your hands up and go zwaves, zwaves, zwaves. And I'm going, no, they didn't exist. That's just been made up just by people who wanted to sell extra paint. Just nonsense. And even if they did exist, they were not wearing their bloody Easter party, you know, Irish Day Parade stuff to go to war. Utter nonsense. They wore the same nonsense, brown and, and blue as everybody else. So the whole uniforms and equipment of the war has been designed, it's been invented after the fact to take the piss out of war gamers because everybody knows that we're a bunch of OCD obsessed, susceptible individuals. So having something completely identical that there's no facts about, it's all just nonsense. Very, very difficult to, um, for us to get our heads around. So even the similarities between the two armies are so great that the facial hair of the generals was the same. And in some ways, this is the only difference, the subtle differences in facial hair. So <clears throat> if you look at facial hair, and, and if you look at the, um, the proceedings of the Natural Institute of Science, which is a real thing that's on the internet, because um, everything on the internet is real. In November 2015, their Natural Institute of Science proceedings book, volume two for hard science, there's proper data behind this, produced a study entitled Beards of War, the relationship between facial hair and battle outcome in the US Civil War. And <laughs> they used facial hair data gathered from commanders of the US Civil War and mapped it against the National Park Service database on the outcome of battles of the Civil War. And they evaluated a hypothesis that bearditude, which I think is a fabulous word, we should turn it on its head and use it for peak, but bearditude positively correlates with military success. And, and if you look at 226 battles in which the beard to face ratio of the commanders on both sides is actually known, the commander with the bigger beard won 114 of those 226, which is 50.4%. So that's still pretty bloody equal, but it does mean that the more hairy the, the officer was, they could win two more battles in the whole civil war than, than less hairy. At but there's a lot more analysis about um, different types, um, different types of hair. If you had mutton chops with a mustache, there were six battles involving a general with that 100% success rate. So that was the facial hairstyle to go for. Goatee beard, just a goatee, no. One win out of six, you know, a five and one against. That's really the worst kind of thing. And there's all sorts of things. But the whole thing, parrot guns, uniforms, weapons, the rest of it, the only difference between the two sides is which barber you went to. That's it. And how do you simulate that in a bloody war game? Sergeant, I, I, not, Tim, I think you are underbaking the importance of the beardiness and suitness mm. because what's important here is, okay, generals in the American Civil War didn't know how to coordinate a successful offence, okay? They, they just couldn't. They just blundered around, yeah. fell into each other for four years until everyone dropped down dead. Okay? Normally in a wood, yeah. But what you get is in the 1840s and the 1850s, you had Ron Mulk in Prussia, training his general staff to be successful officers barbers. and successful generals. Yeah, barbers. But he not should barbers. No, be successful see, barbers, barbers by this. Now, the Prussians... The no, no, no. The Prussians 
went for the whole let's try and train our generals to be good at commanding troops stuff. And that kind of worked, as proved in 1866 and 1870. But I think at West Point during the 1840s and the 1850s, there was lots and lots of lessons, military lessons about asuteness and beardiness. Okay, mm. And it's not just about how big the beard was. If you look at some of the photographs of the generals in the American Civil War, some of these pieces of facial the hair facial furniture. Just, yeah. oh, it's just craziness some of the beers yeah. just craziness they studied at west point how mm. to do this stuff for a couple yeah. of decades and yeah. if the american civil war didn't happen we would never get to see such facial hair craziness i mean because i look at peter and i look at his beard and he's just not trying and i look at andy and that's just a bit rubbish as well it's, it's only because I, I trimmed it it was looking sort of proper american civil war raggedy no I no i might have to american... no nah, but i you see i need to grow it out i have just no, realized for peter, the next competition i've got to grow it out and get really bushy because no, pre proper american civil war is really big sideburns yeah. nothing on the cheeks maybe a big curly beard and maybe sort of like the middle of the chin missing with two bits coming out like this no, 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 there's some bad. really oh, good, long, bushy okay, ones. If you, if you look at the Adam, I know, you, I know you do look a bit like General Burnside, especially if you stuck the whiskers on, but he was one of the least successful generals of the Civil War. Yeah, but that's why you've got to look at the data, Andy, you know, because I think, Adam, you're absolutely right. Because if you've got um, the sort of facial hair that's best described as friendly mutton chops, um, you know, either side, something good to hang on to. I mean, the sideburns were even named after him. You're, you know, at a 66% win ratio. Whereas, you know, Peter, short beard, I think I'm saying, you know, 0.485 win ratio. You've got, um, you know, a number, you've also got 28 of, the, of nearly 140 of those battles were inconclusive. So you're not even getting decisive results due to your facial hair if you're in the American Civil War. So no, we would have not seen such beardage without the war. No. And Having such beardage in history, I think, is a good service that the Americans have done for see, the world. So see, Tim, I, I think point. part of your rant is doing yourself a disservice because at the end of the day, American Civil War is great for my level of painting. One can of blue spray, one can of grey spray. I don't see what the problem is. You know, army, instant army. But, but I think this is, where, this is where there's still, you're missing the great opportunity for people of your low talent to paint things in the American Civil War because the only place in the American Civil War where there actually was some innovation and some, you know, novelty and clever stuff going on was in the naval side. And, you know, ironclads and monitors, and there was a huge amount of innovation there. It was kind of a crucible. Of well, hang on. But, well, well, this is the one said, where they fired each like... other for a whole day and then quit. Hang on, Peter, let me just say, I read somewhere that if you want to simulate American Civil War naval war gaming between ironclads, you should get two people, put a saucepan on their heads, Give them each a hammer, and they each take it in turns to whack each other on the head until one of them gets fed up, and that's exactly. how you simulate the effects exactly. of um, American Civil War naval combat. And that's American that's Civil War like a job the Battle Townsmen's Guild. Yes, the Battle Townsmen's Guild, and this is exactly what I'm no, saying. They did so the only Harbor, bit they started later. The only bit of the war where there was innovation and development was designed again to take the piss out of war gamers. So, you know, where you start is with. Multi-masted ships of the line, broadsides, boarding parties, privateers, cutlasses, Captain Pugwash, all that sort of stuff going on. And then, because the innovation evolves that into something you can simulate by literally putting a pot on your head and staggering around the dark and hitting someone else with a spoon. And, right. or, and then from a wargaming point of view, you make it by cutting out a piece of cardboard into an oval and spraying it grey. If you're lucky... You can put a turret on the top, which, you know, still is dark grey. And the only good side about that is it's a callback to three weeks ago when you can use redundant Humbrol tins on it. They're perfectly designed at the right scale to act as the turret. But other than that, naval innovation in the American Civil War, its only function was to hammer the fun out of it for war gamers from something that was quite fun to paint and do and complex to something that was really, really dull but at Peter's level, yeah, the, mon the, mon the Merrimack, when it came out, was described as a floating barn. Hmm. You've, you're also missing a trick here for the naval side because that hmm. can actually be quite fun. Because lots of American war gamers are American particularists. They think everything to do with America is great. They tell you that the Americans of the war invented modern 
military tactics, which is, of course, nonsense. And they go, oh, yeah, and it's like ironclads, and we invented ironclads, and it's all innovation. American ironclads were crap, okay? And it's quite fun to have this conversation with Americans. Ah, oh, the Monitor, it's like it was a first turreted ship. No, it wasn't. HMS Trusty was. It was a first ironclad. No, it wasn't. No, it wasn't. Like Glauar was. Oh, yeah, but... And then you say, the Monitor, how did she sink? She sank sailing along in a bit of a storm. That's how good a ship she was. But they went out to sea by by, by itself, basically. Yeah, that's how good a ship she was. But two two points, two points I want to make. One sort of like, obviously, a bit jokey and not serious. The other sort of like really serious thing about why the American Civil War was um, important. Um, So firstly, the important one is Fire and Fury is one of the best war game tools I've ever played. Okay, they give fantastically good games. So it's good that the American Civil War happened because it cr- created one of the best uh, war games rules I've ever played. Yeah, now, you so much terrain for those rules. You should need shed loads of it to do it properly. But obviously, the not so serious one is sort of like getting rid of slavery and that is kind of important. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Look, OK, I think you must say that, that, yes, the American Civil War did technically bring to an end the heinous and evil practice of slavery in the United States. It freed millions from lives of servitude and often unspeakable cruelty. Um, you know, that is a perfectly legitimate argument to deploy. And um, But I think if you just look at the bigger picture, which is the important bit, um, everyone else in the rest of the world just kind of stopped because it was like heinous and evil and everybody kind of realised that and just stopped it. Um, Britain stopped it in 1833 even the whole empire, you know, even the bits that no one was really looking at. France, 1848, that stopped it, all the, the French colonies. Most of Latin America had stopped it by 1826, a long time before this. The northern states in you know, most of America, footprint-wise, economy-wise, the bit that was obviously going to win, had all stopped by 1804. So, so really, it's kind of like the slavery, yes, was stopping, had to stop, was terrible, it's great, it's all gone, but but to actually have to have a war with yourself because some of your own people don't really want to give up a practice that the rest of the world finds abhorrent. You know, that's from a British point of view, that's quite embarrassing, isn't it really? You know, what, what we would do is go, Oh, that was a bit awkward. Um, shall we all just pretend that didn't happen and go and have a cup of tea? And unfortunately Americans threw all the tea into the, the harbor. So they didn't have that sort of sweeping under the carpet and um and let's not talk about what we, Antioch we, we did. We did kind of stretch wedding. out the English Civil War though, didn't we? Yeah, but we ended up, you know, we gave the world. Yeah, we got three civil wars out of it, didn't we? We got three civil wars about it. There was loads of history that's still going on, and um, you know, and all sorts of interesting things. And some. But the beards weren't as good. But funnily enough, the haircuts were better. Yeah, the haircuts were better. Yeah, swings and roundabouts. I've had as well. Yeah, we got different unit types, didn't you? I mean, but Martin Van Tol set up a competition in the club years ago for the English Civil War and got about thirty-two different armies with different nuances out of it. Um, yeah, exactly. And, you know, the, the kind of Cromwell's new model army, you compare that with Montrose's guys running around Scotland with bows and arrows and tartans and Irishmen yeah. and whatnot, and it's completely different armies. Yeah. You don't get that in the American Civil War. No, but I think, again, one of the other things about the American Civil War, though, you know, because those battles here, at least we've done the decent thing, and to sort of try and forget about it, we've, we've kind of built car parks and shopping centres over those battlefields. But the Americans, with their battlefields... They, there's no, you know, there's no hard work involved. There's no imagination. You don't have to dig up a car park in Leicester to try and find out what happened or stuff. So minutes after the battle's finished, somebody marched in and went, actually, let's keep this. This might be important. Let's make a national park. We'll get people in. We'll get mowing the lawns. We'll get lawn keepers in. We'll, you know, we'll do some horticulture. We'll, we'll <clears throat> even, by the end of it, they, they start putting roads through so you can do a battlefield tour without even getting out of your car. Um and these are places, so they just even made it so easy that it's it's too lazy to do so. And, and the only complicated thing about getting hold of American Civil War battlefields, making it just too easy, there's no sense of achievement, is all of them have got multiple names. They can't even settle on one name, even though one side won. There's still two names. You know, is it Manassas? Is it Bull Run? In fact, Manassas and Bull Run, they fought the same battle on the same place twice. How unimaginative is that? They've not, you know, you think normally you might, oh, we'll shift one of the bits of terrain around or move that field to make it more interesting or something. But but no, it's like, let's turn up and do it again. And Sharps, or is it Antitam, Antietam? 
Yeah, you know, the thing, okay. it was because the union, no, so who knows? The, the union, the union side was obsessed by waterways, and they named battles after the nearest waterway, whereas the Confederates named after the nearest town. So, Shiloh is known as Pittsburgh Landing, Murfreesboro, Stones River. But Andy, you know, I don't think, you know, I don't think like you're um, you're really building a compelling case that not there's you know, the most interesting thing is how they chose to name the battlefields. We've still not got anything interesting happening in the battlefields. And, you know, and if you look at some of the well, other well, battles... Well, like, it was, it's um, quite entertaining because usually most battles were resolved because somebody got lost or, or failed yeah. to turn up or had the hump or something. Or some of them were sieges. You know, one of the famous ones, which I had me, me and you have actually been to, the Siege of St. Petersburg, huge famous battle, you know, huge thing you can tour around. What it's famous for is a massive mine and a massive explosion. And that's the centerpiece of the battlefield. And we walked, you know, miles across this battlefield on a boiling hot day through it and with big build up. And you're going, that's kind of a reasonable sized hole in the ground. The, the, crater the, crater the, the crater's a bit naff, isn't it? I've been yeah, there. That, but that's the most important bit. And it's a bit shit. But yeah. I tell you what, I mean, there's much bigger, the, much bigger craters in uh, Belgium in, in yeah. World War One. Well, we did a problem. All the statues and the memorials from the sisterhood of the Confederacy were very impressive, if slightly creepy and scary. Yeah, although they may not be there now, I suspect not. But and then the you know the absolute whole super wargaming pivot point, which makes it something that the world of wargaming would be much better without, is the most famous single bit of all, which is Pickett's Charge, which my proposition, you know, the whole proposition could be built on this as well, is that it's just a bad thing for the world of wargaming. So Pickett's Charge was just a bit shit. It was going to fail. Its own commander, Longstreet, said, this will fail. It was a full frontal attack on a prepared position, and that prepared position was called Cemetery Ridge. Now, clues in the name, boys. This is not going to end well for you, really. And every tedious wargamer has now, as a result of this whole American Civil War and pickets charge, got the same story. Well, I went to the battlefield of Gettysburg and I walked Pickett's Charge and stone me, it's a surprising long way on the real world and a lot of it's uphill. And it's like, no shit, Sherlock. If you've not noticed that you're a borderline morbidly obese bloke in your 60s with a sedentary hobby, you probably deserve to be surprised that running three quarters of a mile up a hill in August, because of course that's when you go to bloody historical, isn't it, is way beyond your capabilities. So perhaps if you've got that lack of self-awareness, maybe you too could actually have been in the footsteps of Longstreet. And, you know, although he did even know it was going to fail. But Tim, admit one thing. It does look Admit one thing. The, that day yeah. out, that day out in Antietam, that was a good day. It was a jolly day, but that was probably because of, um, of the night before and the night after, I suspect. Um, no, walking back was interesting. We and we went oh, to the sunken lane. And really good that was fun, though. Yeah, yeah. No, and tea time's a nice battlefield where the um, be fair, where the bridge is. But, you know, it'd be a lovely, it'd be a lovely garden centre as well. You know, if they had a, a tea shop there, it'd be even better. But so just to kind of sum it up, so it's a pointless war. It's so short, it barely scratches the plaque of history. It's two armies who couldn't find each other in a phone box. There's no difference between the two sides in tactics, weapons. The uniforms are designed from the ground up to trigger war games OCD and then frustrate it. The only important factor in determining who wins can't really be modelled below 28 mil scale, which is facial hair, and no commercially available rule set takes barbarism into account anyway. The naval side could literally be modelled by the beer mats and the condiments that we play with on the table after a competition, um, and that would be actually a more accurate representation of the figures that, that were there anyway. And some of the world's best preserved battlefields are only capable, acres, hundreds of square miles of, of national parkland, is only capable of generating one, the same repetitive, tedious story that is told by every single one of the hundreds of thousands of war games who've been to them all. And that's before I even get onto the Warlord Games unique scale. So I just say, American Civil War, let's park it, let's leave it to the novels, let's leave it to historians, let's leave it to the barbers, to be fair. And you know, the barbers, the, the industry of barbering, they can talk about this all they want, but war gaming, we should just stop it and we should simply move on. But they invented heroin as a result. Has it been what? Because it was so tedious, they needed something no, else to cut. There were so many people addicted to morphine from having their legs cut off and the rest of it. 
they needed a new drug. Yeah, yeah. So they came up with heroin as a, as a substitute for morphine because they said it would cure people of morphine addiction. <laughs> I, and it did. I, it did. <laughs> It did, yeah. The morphine addiction went completely away. So, um, so are you saying that without um, without the American Civil War, there would have been no train spotting, and that's exactly. quite a good film. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. Without the without without the Civil War, Tim, there'd be no postal voting. You'd have to walk down to the election, the the ballot box, and actually post yourself. Because what happened was in 1864, it looked like Lincoln was going to lose the the election, uh -oh. and We're the army. Here. This is and, and, Trump territory. But but he looked like he was going to lose the election, and he thought that the soldiers were likely to support him, which in fact they were. But because he couldn't call, you know, the entire army home to vote because that would mess up what was going on in the war. So they managed to create postal voting, which meant the soldiers could vote from where they were out on campaign. And as a result, more soldiers voted for Lincoln than against him, and that helped him to win the election. So. If you can't be asked to walk down to your local polling station on the 6th of May, it's because, and then you can vote without having to do that, and that's thanks to the American Civil War. Our local polling station is really close, and it would be lovely to see all the neighbours again after six months of lockdown. You know, I don't, I don't see that's a compelling argument for retaining the American Civil War. Um, it's just, there are some maybe, people, again, it's well, another argument for If you're shielding, for, for example, and you can't walk down there, or, or you're, you know, limited mobility, yeah, but then then you're going to be the same person who's going to be telling me that story about trying to fail to get up the hill for um, uh, um, Pickett's charge. And I've heard that story before, Andy, from every other war gamer. So, you know, my, my, my sympathy is limited on that, on that one, I'm afraid. Um, because Street someone else has told me that story. Beard. Long Street definitely had the best beers. Yeah, facial hair. I no, think, Hood. You know, there's a good argument on the facial hair I thing. Hood or Long Street. I thought Long Street had the really good beard. I, I, th I think Hood had, had better beard. Mind you, he, yeah. he, had, he had only one arm and one leg and one eye, so uh, he, had, he had, yeah. had to have some rules. <laughs> yeah. But those other things aren't so important, are they, really? Um, that was surprising he didn't fall over. about really. the facial hair. So, yeah, maybe maybe there is a set of great War Games rules to be written about, about barbering. And, and facial hair use and, and setting those off against each other. But but currently none of that important stuff is actually included in any set of rules, even, even the wonderful Fire and Fury, which is still a pretty good argument. But um, Well, you see, well, you, you know, if it wasn't for the Civil War, um, Peter, and, uh, Peter and Adam wouldn't have the opportunity of being Civil War general lookalikes. Um, you know, because Peter, all he has to do is get out the skull spray, um, spray the hair, spray the beard, and there you are, General Custer. Yes. I don't know if you if you chop Peter off from the nose downwards and take just the top. I think he's making a very very good impression of Mao Zedong. <laughs> and he wasn't in the American Civil War either, was he? No. I'm gonna say the hair's a bit long at the back for that. No, That's... no, it's, it's the it's the sort of balding top and the side swipe. Yeah, I've I've got the sort it's of like the sweeping like hair at the back at the moment. Ball. Oh, there's nearly a ponytail there. So look, you I'm swimming in that lake behind you, like Mount Say Tung swimming across the lake or river or whatever. But that's, you that's you're changing the subject. That's my proposition. I'm resting my case. I think there's it's just too dull. The world will be better off without it. There are some saving graces, but but a war games conflict which can really be modelled by facial hair, and that alone is the only difference between the two sides. And even that's like paper thin. I just think we don't need it, but. But I think on that note, it's now time to, unless anybody else got any other, other closing points, to go around the screen and say, American Civil War, should we bin it off? Are we better off without it or not? What do you think? I think it's, binning it would be a good idea because it doesn't really add much value to the wargaming community. However, we do have many wargamers who have been emulating these beards for quite a long while. So what would they then play? Because, I mean, the Australian Civil War wasn't particularly well, uh, well known. It was <laughs> two guys down in a bar having a bit of a fight. 
but you know, it was just last week. Well, again, beat up by ostrich, emu, <laughs> you know, or kangaroo, um, emu war. I don't know. I, I think we could all be wearing, you know, English Civil War facial hair. That uh, that there are substitute facial hair um, opportunities there. But other yeah. facial hairs are available. Other facial hairs are available. So, so what do you think? Do you, do you support my proposition, or or is it going to be? I support it. Get rid of it. Support. Add no value it. to anything. Okay, Tamsin, which which way are you going to go? Oh, it's. I I'd say I keep it. I because I nostalgia for I, I remember the first war gaming figures really where I had both sides was with the FX plastics. Oh, that's a good one. And I suppose you had just painted up a million um six Yeah, millions. and I've just painted up a load. Yeah. And uh, so, as I say the nostalgia, I have the Donald Featherstone books. True. <laughs> and there's a great I was a great book. I David Chandler, I uh, think it was David Chandler, Art of Warfare on Land, where he had the colour pages of Peter Gilder's collection. So, so Tamsin, where, where where are you with this? Where are you going to come down? There's a lot well, of say, there. I'm sorry, Tim. I think you're an ass. Okay, let's move around the screen swiftly then. Dave, in your hobby bunker. Ass. It's a storm in a teacup. That is the whole point. That was my proposition. But you're you're a storm in a teacup sort of guy, then. A teacup, not not a storm in a beanie hat. Uh, Mr. Finkel, with your um with your facial hair, you know which way are you going to lean? I I think I've actually got to agree with you, having sold off my Civil War figures a few years ago. Okay, Mr. Mr. Adam and your mystery um similarity to a mystery general. You have no idea who it is. And so on on the one hand, I would say with you that a war game draw that does take beardage into a war game draws that does take beardage into account would be a very good thing. But there are two things that I'm gonna send me down the arse alley, which is actually no, I don't think that's you care to rephrase that, but, sir. Yeah. Anyhow, um firstly, um I've me and you, we we fought Antietam over about 10 hours drinking beer and just like playing the whole battle just and it was it was lots of fun actually so i kind of enjoyed that and the second thing is something tamden said it reminds me of my early copies of sort of like miniature war games number six where there were full page color photographs of peter gilder's american civil war figures and it's them and there's napoleonic figures so i looked at and thought that looks fantastic okay so i am going to say american civil war war love it you're an ass Okay then, so it's it's three and two. So Peter, with your American Civil War hairstyle and facial hair, um, and your love of simplistic painting, um, where are you going with this one? You're an ass. It's simple, you know. It's look, you're just envious of the facial hair and the flowing locks. It's but just that hair, why really. you've got an issue with it. Plus the fact that it brings a lot of Americans into playing the game, and it's got the facial hair. Did I mention the facial hair? Yeah, see, you're an arse, Tim. Okay, all right. So that's a three and three, then. It's a tie this week on this week's episode of I'm Sorry, I Think You're an Arse. Well, as the Elephant Death Star of Time hits the medium foot battle line of destiny, I see that's all we've got time for on this week's episode. So goodbye, and we'll see you next week on I'm Sorry, I Think You're an Arse. <laughs> With that, um, with that theme tune music reside, receding into the distance and a tie on this week's um, It's I, 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 um, And let's look at who's been playing in the last two weeks. And I think that's a short list of one. So, so Mr. Finkel, do you want to give us a quick summary of, I'm guessing, two strategic games against Mr. Ray in the States? Uh, basically, yes. Um, both of them ancient period with chariots. Uh, first one we did was about two weeks ago, and I'm struggling to remember all the details, but... I think it was Megiddo where Dave had the um, New Kingdom Egyptians and I had the Syrian uh, states. And again, the dice were unkind to him, but um, we managed to hold off. I think I had more heavy chariots than he did. And they sort of rolled over his medium foot and he got a bit upset about that. But hey, he shouldn't have done it. Um, and then last week we were doing 
a battle of Susa, which was um, Babylonians against Elamites and I had the choice of armies. And even though the Babylonians had a chariot, I chose the Elamites because I thought they were slightly less crap. And um, that was a very close battle, uh, but I, I managed to win it, even though next turn I probably would have lost my army. Okay. But well, uh, the, 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 these early, these, um, you know, like chariot games are quite fun. And, and I guess there's a chance that they'll change even more once the, um, uh, that might be one of the periods that changes more than most in the new versions of ADLG with some of the hints that we've seen as well. So maybe yeah. you'll be able to replay them. Indeed. Well, we, yeah, we, some of the games that we can go back and redo under version four and see how, how, if they're any different. But, you know, if if, if um, light chariots become armoured, that could certainly make, make things a lot different. Yeah, that would be a game changer. It would be almost be as, as radical as... Was moving from talking about wargaming to moving talking about French techno music. So with that music fading into the Gallic background, and that must mean it is now time for the answers from a two weeks ago's quiz. I'm you know, I'm, I'm struggling to remember my own name from two weeks ago. But Andy, what was the topic and what were the questions? Well, the topic, remember, I gave you a choice and you chose Down Mexico Way. And the first question was, during the Battle of San Jacinto in 1836, which helped to secure the independence of Texas from Mexico, how did the Texians generate surprise when they attacked the Mexican army? Texans, not the Texians. Um, well, Tamsin knows. Go on, tell us, Tamsin. Oh, if they moved up to fairly close range and undercut behind long grass and only fired one volley before charging in. Um, that's probably right, but the main reason is they attacked while the Mexican army was having a siesta. Yeah, uh, well, that was that uh -huh. as well. A so, um, siesta. Yeah. Indeed, right. Okay. okay. The second question was, how many presidents of the USA served in the US Army during that Mexican-American War? Mexican-American War of 1846 to 1847. Dave's making rude signs. Tamsin's making um, Star Trek signs. So that, that's, that's probably guessing it's a two then, isn't it? Or three? Well, the two? answer is actually oh. three. Oh. Three? Oh. Yeah, Tamsin, Dave oh. thought it was two, Tamsin was, thought it was four. Well, the three I've got are Zachary Taylor, Franklin Pierce and Ulysses Grant. Oh. He was a president. He wasn't in the army. I thought he was. Thought no, he... Polk was a president at the time. Ah, I've, I've been to Zachary Taylor's fort. There we go. Um, oh, yeah, right. all named after him. And the third question was, in January 1917, the German foreign minister sent a telegram to the German ambassador in Mexico, offering the Mexican government support to recover Arizona, Texas and New Mexico if they joined Germany in attacking the USA. The telegram was intercepted by the British intelligence and passed on to the US government. What was the name given to this incident? Zimmerfrain. Near enough. Zinoviev. No. Yeah. It was actually called no. the Zimmerman telegram incident. Oh, it's the Bob Dylan one. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. blowing right. in the wind and all that. Right. Bobby Zimmerman. Yes. So this week, we, we, go, we go the topic which you chose not to answer last week, which was, what's it like out? And the first question, and these are all about weather-related questions. So question one, in which battle in 1777 did more British troops die of heat stroke than from enemy action? Oh, pass, not sure. Okay, right. Number two, Whose corps suffered heavy casualties when it lost its way during a snowstorm at the Battle of Eilau in 1807 and marched across the front of a Russian ground battery? Murat. I'm saying French names or something. <laughs> Is that a French name? No, no. Yeah, it don't. was, but he was a French general, but it wasn't him. You'll have to wait till next week to find out. Okay. And number three, the term kamikaze means divine wind. Mm -hmm. What is the nationality of the first ship sunk by kamikaze? Wow. Oh, technical question. And um, 
you know, we'll, and it's not a hint that we're now going to move in some Gallic techno. <laughs> So look, with the techno music fading into the background, we're about to fade into background for another fortnight um, in our in our new agenda. I think two weeks from now, we will um, almost certainly be doing and hopefully be doing an ADLG version four special because we will all have had touch wood the, the book in our sweaty palms for, for a week or so and, and we'll all be experts on it and be able to speculate wildly still without likely uh, play the game at all as, uh, as the weather improves. Although maybe there's some outdoor gaming to be done as we, we inch closer towards indoor gaming and pubs opening and things like that happening. So just, just to quickly run round before, before we time ourselves out to see what's likely to happen in the next, you know, painting, painting wise in the next couple of weeks. So Simon, what are you, what are you hoping to achieve over the next couple of weeks? I'm hoping to finish my pikemen off for the uh, Macedonians. Okay. Nice and solid. Are you going to go shield transferring? You're going to do, um, um, or were you leaving them just with the bronze shields? No, I think I'll, I'll sit down there and try to work out how to paint um, crosses really accurately by hand. Yeah. In black, definitely. Yeah, That's yeah. the answer. Yes. Um, Peter, you're looking cross. Um, you know, other than two weeks more and possibly two weeks more of hair, um, and that will be the big news for us all. Um, what's, what's your next two weeks? Are you going to press the purchase button before the new rules and really gamble, or are you going to actually... Have oh yeah, control and wait. I'm just self control. Why? Why? Yes. I get to buy more miniatures. What's the problem? Yep. Don't understand the issue, really. Yeah, no. Of course. Yep. Um, I've already been searching while we've been talking about it, and found some forged in battle um, uh, bolt throwers that can be mounted on mule carts. And I'm like, yep, yeah, I'm pressing go tomorrow morning. Fish uh, fish so I'll get that. Yep, yeah, fish done. Um, and then it's um, sort of sending emails to Kurosan saying I, I want to get my um, Assyrians sorted uh, oh, yeah. Dave's waving various carts at me Dave waves he's, he's trying to give me an idea okay all right um, well Dave you're you're the cart waver and actually I forgot to mention when we we went around things before those um those 10 mil figures that I passed to you in a in a car park somewhere in a, a no, weird no. suburb have you um have you managed to make a start on those as yet no uh, not at all I haven't had time to do anything but uh, tromp the streets of London. Okay. Well, maybe then in, in a couple of weeks, because I'm staring at mine here, which are sort of a bit painted. Maybe there's a kind of a 10 mil um, apocalypse miniatures comparison to be done in, um, in a couple of weeks, see how they get. I'll put them on my table now and they will be next. They will be are next. Th are these the Baron's War ones? Yeah, these are the Baron's Wall ones. Yeah, oh, yeah I've, got, good. I've made yeah. a little bit of a start on some of mine actually, but um, colourful little, colourful little geezers. Need some dry brushing, sort of gun metal. And... Yeah. So, so apart from the Baron Knights, do they do any other pop groups? Um, I think there's a Wurzels one that they're coming on, and um, but they're, they're getting a ten mil combine harvester is just a little bit more difficult to do. The, the you know, getting the the yeah, but you can put the wallpaper right on it. That would look really good, wouldn't it? Yes, yeah, wallpaper. Post, post harvester. wallpaper on a combine harvester. Indeed. Um, so, Andy, what <laughs> other than um, taking rare and exotic drugs, what are you planning for the next two weeks? Uh, probably just um, uh, more of this ten mil uh, O group stuff. Um, I'm, 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 I might summon up the energy to try and stick the uh, Hannah mags together and see how many bits I've got left over, and possibly try painting them. Um, that kind of stuff, and I, I suspect that by the time I spend time reading and looking at uh, ADLG4 as and when it arrives, that'll probably fill in any painting I get around to doing. Okay, that might inspire some other stuff. And um, Tamsin, you're, um, you, another two weeks, you've got another... No, I should, I, weeks, I should finish the US Paris and oh, I should, should finish them very quickly. Uh, uh, put, after that, I'll probably do the Polish Paris. All oh, right, the, the European ones, um, mm. the proper smocks and things like that. Yeah. Well, well that'll be something to look forward to. Good. Are, are, the fig yeah. are the figures already in hand for that? Um, yes. Yeah, I, they're, they're already ready. To, prepped, I, undercoated. Prepped, primed. Okay. Is this a project to do every nation's paratroopers? 
I don't think I'll be doing Italian or Russian. Oh, okay. Might eventually yeah. do some fashion yoga. Very well said. Very well said. And um, Adam, you're um, you're far enough away for us to have a four year war down um, down the M3. Um, what what's your next two weeks looking like? Maybe in American Civil War they just keep getting stuck at Winchester Services because I know I do when I come down the M3. Yeah, it's very tempting. I stop for an ice cream. You know, it's a Magnum. Maybe that maybe it's just the fridge ended up had a lot of Magnums or something. They yeah, kept handing them out. Yeah. Um, but it's I'm sort of like my these nights should be finished in the next two weeks. Um, so I've got the uh, ten mil or twelve mil or whatever fucking scale it is. Um, prepped up, so I need to decide what to prep up next because I'm doing a 28 mil IDOG, something else, back and forth. Mm. So I did tell myself I was going to get all the mounted stuff done. So um, I was thinking of doing like the mounted crossbowmen and the lesser men at arms and stuff. But I'm also thinking, oh, Swiss pipe block. That sounds that sounds exciting. So um, I might sort of like weaken and do that instead. So um, I, I will discover. Yeah, so would that be using the Warlord Lanchnet Freddy Freddy ones, or would that be doing the earlier using the um the it's the early it's Perry the Perry ones, ones because this is it's not for Renaissance, it's for yeah. like the French 15th century. So it's like the so rather than sort of frilly, they'll be in cantonal colours, which itself is colourful really enough cool. by by all means, yeah. Well, I guess. yeah. Excellent. I think from from my point of view, yeah, I think I should get to get these ten mil ones done. Basing the Thracians is is a work on that's actually happening already, so they will definitely be done. That's that's super close now. They're all glued on the bases and things like that. And then it's thinking, what's the next thing to start? I've got all sorts of things which are undercoated Persian cavalry. I've got some ten mil Napoleonics. I've got some um, some Egyptian spearmen um, as well that could be done. But I may still, now that there's a few more 10 mil World War II stuff going on, I may go back to my German tanks, which are sort of about 30% done in, in base coat and Dunkel Gelb and the green stripes, but they've not had the brown and they've not had the weathering and they've not had the numbers. So so I think I may well you know, bite the bullet and finish with that. Try and start, well, get started and finishing um, or started to finish that German thing um, to have that all done um and well i doubt it'll be done in two weeks but it will be it will be underway and um yeah but you know it'll be nice to do something that doesn't have little big man transfers for it really but but with that i think the main thing that we're all going to be doing is waiting for adlg version 4 to drop on our um drop on our doormats and as i say next two weeks from now fingers crossed we will all be doing a what do you think of the brand new rule book um first start into um adlg version 4 so on that note, it's time to say goodbye. Goodbye, everybody. Goodbye, Bye. everyone. Bye. get to interject was that one comment i it was because you, you you were saying about uh, you could get from washington dc to richmond virginia in four hours in the sherman tank no i don't think you could i like sherman it would take a right turn and head down to atlanta this means war